King Pai had officially established the 25th dynasty of Egypt, also known as the Nubian dynasty. When we think of the Nile River throughout history, it's very easy to think mainly of ancient Egypt. They were, after all, an immense empire who seemingly had control over the majority of the river. And for whatever reason, their culture seems to be the one that has most intrigued us to this day. But one kingdom in particular provided a great rival to the ancient Egyptians, and that was the kingdom of Kush. So we're talking about the Nubians. Now, Nubia itself was located in the northeast of Africa, and its territory actually included parts of what is now southern Egypt and the northern parts of modern day Sudan. Now, just for the sake of clarity, I should point out that the regions around the Nile were labelled upper and lower. So there was upper Egypt and lower Egypt, upper Nubia and lower Nubia. But this was actually based on the direction that the Nile River flowed in. Now, this obviously makes sense, right? As you get closer to the source of the river, you're going upstream. And as you get closer to the mouth of the river, you're traveling downstream. But because of the way we've orientated things and look at maps, it's kind of left us in this confusing kind of state where upper refers to the more southern end of a region and lower refers to the more northern end. So just remember that in this video, upper is south and lower is north. Now the term Nubian doesn't actually refer to a specific group of people. Ancient Nubia was very diverse, consisting of people from different cultures, speaking different languages and holding different religious beliefs. So think of it more as a kind of multicultural hub. Although it is fair to say that the dominant culture was most likely very similar to that of their neighbors to the north, the Egyptians. And the people of Nubia would have been settled along this part of the river Nile from around 3100 BCE. So pretty similar to when we see the first dynasty of ancient Egypt starting to take hold. Now Nubia was rich in natural resources, including gold, carnelian, which is this beautiful red stone which has close ties to the Egyptian sun god, as well as other minerals mined from the Nubian desert. And this would almost set the foundation for the first kingdom of Kush. So the city of Kerma. The city of Kerma was established in 2400 BCE and it provided great trade connections with Egypt. And its strategic location along the river would prove to be crucial in the growth of the kingdom of Kush. Although I guess technically it could be regarded more as a forerunner to the kingdom of Kush. So to understand the significance of Kerma's location, we have to look at the Nile itself. So the flow of the river was broken up by what are called cataracts. These were rock formations, which broke the surface of the water at different points along the river. There were six of these cataracts in total. So these formations turned the river into basically an impassable deluge of white water rapid. And from the point of view of the Egyptians, the city of Kerma was located just beyond the third cataract, which meant that any attempt to invade would in theory be halted. As I said, it was impassable. So you would have to stop before you got to the rapids, unload all your goods before passing the cataract on foot and entering into Kerma. So it was naturally well defended, but also being able to offer such rich resources like the ones I was talking about, the city of Kerma stood as a marketplace to refuel and commence trade, almost like a center of commerce. So Kerma became a huge asset to the region of Nubia. And as it started to gain a foothold, the Nubians in Kerma started to launch their own invasions of some cities in Upper Egypt. But although they had gained some power and influence through their trade with Egypt, the sheer might of the Egyptian empire couldn't be stopped. And of course, we already know that Nubia had a lot of things which the Egyptians wanted only now they had reason to take them by force. As we see throughout history, regions which are rich in resources often find themselves at risk of invasion from bigger and more powerful systems. Nubia was no exception. As the Egyptians initially began their invasion into Nubia, it was hard to muster any meaningful resistance and the Nubians would be pushed further and further south up the Nile, with lower Nubia, including Kerma, now being absorbed into the Egyptian empire. With Nubia now having a much smaller territory, its capital was moved south to the city of Nepal. Napata. And although the era of Kerma can be regarded as the first kingdom of Kush, it's this era of Napata where stability was founded and the kingdom truly began to thrive. Founded by King Alara around 790 BCE, the kingdom of Kush would begin to re-establish its influence from its new capital, rebuilding its trade connections with Egypt and also expanding their reach into the Arab regions, allowing them to significantly grow their economic power over the coming generations. And this is where there was somewhat of a power shift. The once mighty Egypt found its Itself becoming weaker. It was the subject of a lot of political instability, which the Kushites were able to capitalize on. With much more strength and power than they'd ever had before, they began to invade and conquer key Egyptian cities such as Thebes. Over time, Egypt would crumble. And in 744 BCE, the kingdom of Kush, now ruled by King Pai, 
would have full control over the Egyptian Empire, with Pai ruling from his capital, Napata. The Kingdom of Kush, or the Nubian Kingdom, was now at the peak of its powers, and King Pai had officially established the 25th Dynasty of Egypt, also known as the Nubian Dynasty. This command over Egypt would last until 656 BCE, 100 years after it was established, eventually falling to the Assyrian Empire from the east. There was a desire from the Kushites and the Egyptians to expand the empire into Assyrian territories, but the Assyrian were just much larger and much more advanced in their warfare, from their weaponry to their military tactics. So the Kushites retreated back to Napata and again formed a new capital, again further south than they had previously. This was the city of Meroe, ruled by King Ergomenes. It was perhaps the highest point for the Kingdom of Kush in terms of its wealth and independence, and Ergomenes is often credited as bringing this prosperity to the kingdom. Having been so closely tied with Egypt for such a long time, a lot of their cultural beliefs were shared. We know that the people of Kush worshipped many of the Egyptian gods, and that the city of Meroe was home to many what you might call Egyptian-style pyramids. Let's just talk about Ergomenes for a second. He was a man who craved absolute power, apparently. There was a tradition in Kushite culture, which was actually an example of an Egyptian custom, which essentially gave priests power over the ruler. Since the times when the seat of power was in the Pata, the god Aman would dictate the lifespan of a ruler. So this essentially gave the high priests the power to decide when a king was no longer fit to rule. And when the time came, they would, on behalf of the god Aman, order that the king must commit suicide, with power then being transferred to Aman's next choice of king. But Ergomenes wasn't having any of it. It's said that he was the first to disdain this command. With the determination worthy of a king, he came with an armed force to the forbidden place where the Golden Temple was situated and slaughtered all the priests, abolished this tradition and instituted practices at his own discretion. Now it must be said though that this source has been doubted and there's such a lack of recorded evidence of the Kingdom of Kush that it's hard to know for sure whether the tradition as a whole was just a legend or whether or not there was any truth in it. But regardless of this, Ergomenes his influence was immense and it set up the Kingdom of Kush for a prosperous future. After his reign, Egypt became far less influential on the kingdom and Meroe was able to establish its own cultures and customs, greatly distinguishing itself from the Egyptian influence of its past, creating their own Meroitic script in favour of Egyptian hieroglyphs, creating their own art and also the fierce and formidable queens ruling independently and leading their troops into battle. After some time, the ability of Meroe to sustain itself became weakened. They were depleted their own resources and the city would surely have to be abandoned. However, this isn't what brought the Kingdom of Kush to an end. It's thought that in the 4th century AD there was a dispute with the neighbouring Kingdom of Aksum, potentially over their trade in ivory. This led Kush to attacking Aksum, but as seemed to be the case throughout much of Kush's history, they were met by a much bigger and more formidable resistance. The city of Meroe was sacked and this would accelerate the decline of the Kingdom of Kush. As Christianity began to overtake the traditions of the pharaohs, by the mid 6th century AD, the Kingdom of Kush would be no more. Now, there's so much to cover with the Kingdom of Kush that I couldn't possibly go into all of it. But, you know, I like to keep things bite-sized. So, as always, all of my sources are in the description if you want to dig a little bit deeper on this one. Also, thank you to everyone who's been liking the videos and subscribing to the channel. It means so much to me. It kind of feels like we're really starting to build something now. So, keep going, keep doing it, keep sharing, all of that good stuff. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, then make sure you go and check out this one about the Lost Kingdom of Benin. I'll see you there.